I will just reintroduce uh, Robert Capetta from the College of DuPage. He's going to be our speaker today. Um, he's talking about interesting atypical calculus problems. This is a webinar sponsored by the American Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges, AMATIC. And you can find more information about AMATIC at um, amatic.org on the internet. Uh, the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC, and if they mention commercial products, those are not necessarily endorsed by AMATIC. The webinar platform is provided by the Lyft Institute at Muskegon Community College, and if you have an idea for a future webinar, please feel free to contact me at maria.anderson, with an E, at muskegoncc.edu. So I am going to switch over to um, Robert's slides, and I'll just take a quick uh, vote here in the chat window. Would you prefer to have both of us show up in the uh, window so you can see when I ask questions, or do you want me to turn off my webcam and make Robert's bigger? So if I could just get a, a, a feel on that from the audience here, I'm going to switch over to the other slides. <clears throat> All right, well, I'll just leave both up for the time being, and that way, uh, if I ask a question from one of you, you'll see it. Okay. And I guess I didn't switch to the presenter size, although I thought I had. Let's see. There we go. Should be loading in now. Okay, so over to you, Robert. Thank you so much, Maria. <clears throat> While we're waiting for the first slides to show up, let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, I have been teaching at Illinois two-year colleges for almost 25 years. And I'm one of the rare people who does predominantly upper level classes. This semester I have second and third semester calculus, but I also do developmental courses and statistics, so I'm sort of all the way across the board. Uh, my background is in mathematics education. I did a PhD at Northern Illinois University focusing on how students learn in calculus, looking at how students develop understanding. So here's our first poll question that Maria is going to help us run here. Uh, what do you think the reasons are that students struggle in calculus? So let's see how that goes. And you can choose more than one if you'd like. All right, well, I thank you for participating. <clears throat> that certainly gives us an interesting insight. Insufficient algebra understanding, I mean, that's something that's difficult for us to deal with in calculus class, but it's something we have to think about. Poor study skills, no question, that also came up with a lot of folks. The third one, though, is the one that I'm going to look at, namely this focus on memorization rather than understanding. How can we get students to move beyond that? Lack of student interest, I do think some of these problems can help build interest a little bit. Lousy textbooks, well, no one thought that was an issue. Uh, I certainly think textbooks could be better. But maybe it would think, be nice if we could go ahead and um, get beyond the textbooks. I think maybe we just think our students never open them, so there's no point in saying lousy textbooks. Maria, I need to remove this window, so how do I do that? You want to go to the next poll? or? Uh, okay, so our next poll, which I, again... I think that's your next slide, right? Okay, yep. So what do you think? Most textbook questions are focused on helping students master procedures, are designed to help students develop conceptual understanding enable students to improve their ability in problem solving, are designed to reflect real world problems. So where do you think those textbooks typically go? And it looks like it's unanimous <clears throat> that we're focusing on procedures. And the question I want you to think about, is that really what calculus is about? Is there more that we could do in calculus than just encourage students to master procedural content? So here's a question I want to ask, namely, why do some students successfully learn calculus, successfully learn mathematics, successfully learn, and others do not? What is it that's unique about that? I'm going to just pull in a little bit of learning theory, and this is going back to Piaget. So we're going to talk about internalizing processes, connecting ideas, generaling ideas into new domains, developing personal understanding, and then once you get that understanding, reversing it, looking at it from a backwards perspective. So I've got some um, definitions here moving forward. And one question I want to think about is, can an instructor encourage all students to behave like good students? 
certainly we'll never get to a point where all students are good students, but what can an instructor do to sort of move students in that direction? Uh, and I'm looking at Dubinsky's work from 91 talking about reflective abstraction, but namely recognizing that instructors should encourage students to reflect. We've got to develop activities that increase the likelihood that students will indeed be reflective learners, getting at these five notions. And then I just got some quick definitions here you can look at if you'd like. They'll be on the slides moving forward. But again, internalizing notions, connecting ideas, personal understanding, generalizing beyond a given area, and reversing things. So I've got those five categories, and I try to categorize my problems to fit within those contexts. So do we feel like this sometimes? Teaching a calculus class in front of a bunch of folks who may have other ideas in mind. So um, let me ask you this question. So back to another poll question. So thinking about all of the great unwashed masses that show up in our calculus classes, like our previous slide, which topic do you think from calculus is the one that students have the most difficulty understanding? And it looks like we have a tie between the concept of limits and the meanings of theorems. Now, it's my experience that students can typically evaluate limits correctly, assuming they can do the algebra, but they don't always know what they mean. It is also my experience that students can usually state theorems. They can tell you what they are, but they also don't necessarily know what those things mean. So that's something we're going to think about as we're looking at our problems. Let me ask you this question. Do you think that writing should be an essential part of a calculus curriculum? Is writing an essential part? Do you mean writing like um, like sentences or writing out their thoughts about like the procedural sentences, part? Could you words, clarify that? Words, sentences, paragraphs, essays, paragraphs, okay. sentences, yes. I mean, certainly writing your solutions down as opposed to doing it in your head, I think all of us would agree with that. But, you know, is writing to sort of describe your understanding, is that something we should consider in the calculus class? And three out of four folks said yes, but I think most of us agree that textbooks don't usually go in that direction. So if we think that writing needs to be a part of a calculus curriculum, I think it's going to be up to us to design those activities to help students do that. So here's a question I like to use. So we, you mentioned that you think limits are one area where students really struggle. Well, ask them what their understanding is. So the slide here says carefully explain how to use the limit definition to find the derivative of a function. Be sure to draw some pictures to help clarify that idea. So we're looking at the definition of the derivative, but we're also using the limit to get there. How can we relate those ideas together? So we're coordinating limits and derivatives, as well as developing personal understanding of those concepts. Here's another question talking about limits. Explain whether or not it's possible for a limit to exist if a zero in the denominator results after plugging in the appropriate value. Notice this is not a formal question. This is not something Carl Weierstrass would be happy with, but this is something our students can understand. They can relate to this sort of question. They evaluate limits by plugging things in. They get a zero downstairs. Can the limit exist? Is that an important question for students to think about? Well, here's a question that I get from Annie Selden. If you haven't read her work, I encourage you to do so. She's one of the great thinkers that we have in terms of learning calculus. And the question is, is there an A such that the limit as x approaches 3 of 2x squared minus 2ax plus x minus a minus 1 over x squared minus 2x minus 3 exists? So before I advance the slide, I'll just let you think for a few seconds on the strategy that you would use. And after you've thought of the strategy you would use, how do you think your students would address this sort of a problem? Then I'll show you the strategy that I came up with. We use the plugging in strategy. Okay, and we know that it's fair to plug something in if the function is continuous. We plug in and we get 20 minus 7a over 0. Now, A is a variable, and the question is, is it possible for that limit to exist? What does A have to be for that limit to exist? I think we know a potential solution, namely if A is 20 over 7. We have a chance to get there. But is that sufficient? 
Just because you have a zero divided by zero case after plugging it in, does that mean that the limit has to exist? I still think there's a little bit of work to do, namely plugging that 20 over 7 in and seeing if we get a value that we can work with. Now, I recognize the algebra is challenging here, and you, everybody told me that you think that algebra concerns are a big reason why students struggle, and certainly this would be a situation there. Well, evaluating that limit, factoring, notice just how nasty it is to factor that uh, trinomial, we get an answer of 51 28s. So apparently when A was that value, that limit does exist. But that was one way, right? That was one way to solve that problem. Another way that we could do this problem is using L'Hopital, very handsome guy. And I'm sure many of you have heard the story about L'Hopital, probably wasn't really responsible for L'Hopital's rule. Uh, it was likely his tutor, Mr. Bernoulli, but L'Hopital published it and history gives him credit for it. Looking at L'Hopital, <clears throat> we could take the derivative of the top and the bottom, numerator and denominator, if we have an undetermined form. And doing that and then plugging in, we again get our answer of 51 28 So two ways to do that problem, two approaches to solve what I believe is a non-trivial problem that Annie Selden came up with. Okay, finding real-world uses of calculus is tricky. And I'm not arguing that this is the world's best question. But at least it gets at what a limit means. And these were postage rates from a few years ago where... Anything under an ounce was 44 cents. Anything above an ounce was 61 cents. And if you ask the students if a letter weighs 1.8 ounces, what's the cost? You'd be surprised how many students do not get that problem correct, similarly with 2.2. But the question that I wanted the students to look at is this notion of the limit. What is the limit as x approaches 2? We know that that limit doesn't exist because the limit from the left and the limit from the right are different. But this is a question that many students struggle with. So a real-world example of a piecewise function that helps them understand or helps them see how a limit may not exist. We talked about writing before. I am a person who believes that writing helps people develop conceptual understanding. So I like these sorts of questions. Namely, write a summary of the collection of limit lessons. Write definitions in your own words and include relevant examples and counterexamples. It's not enough to let students copy down textbook definitions because they can do that and do it well. But unfortunately, what happens is what they say and what they know are not necessarily the same things. And you can give them questions to see if they really do understand what these definitions are. Okay, here is uh, one of my favorite questions. Construct the graph of a function whose derivative is constant but not zero. Not the kind of question you see in a textbook. Also, not the kind of question you see in these various computer adaptive systems that students are using to automatically grade homework. Now, you'll notice I put the but not zero on there. The reason I had to do that is when I first was doing the questions, the students would all give me horizontal lines. And many students would just give me the function y equals zero, which is correct, but not getting at what we're looking for. So multiple answers to the same question. A little difficult to grade, but I think it helps them develop the idea of what that means. Now, you'll notice I call this a reversal question because typically we ask students to find the derivative or we ask students to uh, construct a graph and identify the derivative. But given the derivative or this notion of a derivative to construct a function is reversing the idea, as well, of course, as coordinating notions of graphs and slopes and derivatives. Here's another writing question uh, talking about the derivative of a function and limits. Okay, here's sort of a standard question that came out of the Calc Reform Movement. And I'm old enough that I started my career when the, uh, before the Calc Reform Movement hit. And early on, it made a huge difference. Now, the thought was, with technology, with alternative approaches to calculus, that maybe the books could get a little bit thinner and we could focus on the things that are really important. But the reality with the Calc Reform Movement was that we kept all the old stuff and added a lot of new stuff including things like using tables to solve problems. So <clears throat> here is one of those examples. Now, this is not mathematics. I had math professors at the university that would not be happy with me doing this. But I think it's important for students to see that as the change in x or as the h shrinks to 0, we have some stability happening here with our approximation for the derivative. 
So to make an inference that it appears as if that's stabilizing, it appears as if that limit is going to exist and is going to be one third should work for us. Uh, but looking at what happens at zero, so x to the two thirds, the derivative at zero doesn't work. So what are we going to have there? Notice as we approach zero, our uh, numbers from the right get very large. Positively, our numbers coming to zero from the negative side, coming in from the left, become very large negatively. So that's an indication, again, that the limit will not exist. The derivative will not exist. So looking at a graph of this would be nice, too, to demonstrate why in one case the derivative does exist, and in another case it does not. Okay, let's talk about this one. <clears throat> Students memorize formulas. Good students memorize the chain rule, right? Derivative of f of g of x, f prime of g of x times g prime of x. That's a rule. What about extending it? So if you have a rule for f of g of x, why not have a rule for f of g of h of x? If they cannot extend that, so again, we're generalizing from a given case to a different case to see if we can make that connection. Again, to assess whether they really understand the rule in the first place. Here's one of my favorite questions. Let me ask you to look at that for a minute. See if you can think of a strategy that might work to solve that problem. F prime of t is 2 to the t squared. Many students in Calc 2 are going to try to integrate that, and we know they're not going to be very successful with that. G of X is capital F of cos X, and I'm sure you can imagine why I chose to use the capital F. Then evaluate G prime of X. So if you know the chain rule, again, we're trying to generalize the chain rule as well as develop a strategy to internalize a procedure. But if you really know the chain rule, you should be able to use this in this context, right? G prime of x should be f prime of cos x, which I think you know what that would have to be, times the derivative of cos x. And there's our answer. Now you may ask, are there any real world uses for this? Eh, I don't know, probably not for this problem. But in terms of understanding what the chain rule means, it's hard for me to think of anything in calculus more important than the chain rule. So seeing it in different contexts, I believe, is important. Okay, uh, looking at things from multiple perspectives again, 2 sine x cos x, we can find the derivative using the product rule. But we can also rewrite that using the double angle identity. We know 2 sine x cos x is sine of 2x. And we can find the derivative that way. And then the question is, do those agree? The sad part is, sometimes students say they don't, and that doesn't seem to bother them. But reinforcing your solutions, checking them using multiple strategies, I believe is a good thing for students to do. Okay, geometry. I really believe that calculus should be visual. If you can make it visual, if you can relate it to things that they've seen before, they have a better chance to develop some understanding. So, what do we have here? There is a theorem in geometry that says that the radius of a circle is perpendicular to the tangent. A common fact from geometry. And then the question is, can we use implicit derivatives to prove that statement? So think about for a minute how you would do that. In general, how to prove that the radius of the circle is perpendicular to the tangent using implicit derivatives. What would that strategy be? Well, According to our graph, the radial line segment starts at 0, 0 and ends at some point x, y. So if that's the case, we can define the slope of the radial line or the slope of the radius to be y over x. Then we go through the standard procedure, the equation of a circle centered at the origin, which again it is fine in this case. x squared plus y squared is r squared. We can certainly establish the fact that dy dx, the slope of the tangent, is going to be negative x over y. So if the two slopes are negative reciprocals, that's indicative of the fact that the lines are perpendicular. And there's our, there's our picture that we have. <clears throat> Looking indeed at the radial line together with the tangent line being perpendicular.
You have problems two ways. If you're introducing implicit derivatives, I think it's important to do it explicitly first. So if I have x squared plus y squared equals 10, can I write y as an explicit function of x, and can I use that to find dy dx at that point? Can I do the same thing impl implicitly? Can I see if they're the same? So what this is doing is, is this is reinforcing our notions, convincing us, hopefully, that what we're doing is correct, and seeing it in multiple perspectives, coordinating ideas to a different perspectives, as well as internalizing procedures. Okay, time for another poll. Do students in Calculus 2 and Calculus 3 remember the formulas from Calculus 1? So you have three choices there. Let's see which one comes up most Can you give often. us an example of like which types of formulas you're talking about? Give us an example like, do you of... Mean, do they remember the theorems? Do they remember like the power rule? Do they remember the you know, what kinds of remembering? I'm not you... thinking theorems so much. I guess I'm thinking more of rules, maybe okay. derivatives. Like derivative of, rules, for example. Uh, various okay. functions. Yeah. Derivatives of inverse trig functions, for example. Um, the definition of the derivative, these sorts of things? I want to say it depends. So we're getting some students remember the relevant formulas, so that would imply that some don't. Okay. Uh, we had a couple people that feel that many students remember I, the formulas. I think it, I think it really I depends on how, how much it was emphasized, don't you think? Well, that's true, too. Um, my experience is there are certain things they know and know well, and there's other things that they don't know well. And I teach Calc 3 and I teach differential equations often. And if I give them a problem in Calc 3 or Diffie Q that requires trigonometric substitution. Oh, gosh, that's just mean. They don't know how to do that. Okay. They, if I ask them the derivative of an inverse trig function, they don't know that either. Right. So, I mean, those are the sorts of things I'm thinking of. What's important? We can have that conversation mm -hmm. about what's important, and we should have that conversation. But my point is, I don't think students remember as many things as we expect them to. Maybe that's a fair way to put that. All right, so moving on to our next slide, if I can see it. So here's, here's our question. We want to take the inverse secant of 5x. Now, there's a formula that students memorize. Most people have students memorize a formula to find the derivative of inverse secant. I argue that memorization is not the way to go here. I argue that you can use implicit derivatives and you can use triangles to find that derivative. So rather than just memorizing a formula, plugging in numbers and getting an answer, looking at the triangle you have, analyzing it, and then finding the derivative using implicit derivatives. How do I do that? And I am starting to see this in textbooks. When I started teaching, I rarely saw this in textbooks. Well. Secant of y is 5x. If y is the arc secant of x, secant of y is 5x. If secant of y is 5x, we have this triangle, right? If we have that triangle, we can get the third side, call it b. Using the Pythagorean theorem, the third side b is just what 25x squared minus 1. So if the secant of y is 5x, we're going to get this value to represent, to represent b. Now putting this together, y is the arc secant of 5x. Our goal is to find dy dx, because dy dx is the derivative of inverse secant of 5x. If y is the inverse secant of 5x, that means secant of y is 5x, triangle we looked at before. So the derivative of secant of y is the derivative of 5x. Derivative of secant y, sec y tangent y, hopefully they have that memorized. If not, they can develop it with the quotient rule or the chain rule. Sec y tan y dy dx is 5. Solving for dy dx, we get 5 over sec y tan y. So now look at our triangle. What is sec y? Sec y is 5x. What is tangent y? Tangent y is root 25x squared minus 1. So making our substitution, we get our derivative for the inverse secant with a relatively straightforward triangle. Now, the advantage of teaching it this way is in essence, this is the opposite strategy that you would use to do uh, trigonometric substitution integral. So if you teach the derivatives of the inverse trig functions using the same model, you've got a better chance that students will use this correctly with trig substitution. And I have to say, I've had a lot of success with this strategy. The students I have remember this. The students that come from other classes typically do not. 
So another question, another poll question. If students can correctly state a theorem or a definition, does that mean they understand it? Yes or no? What do you think? 100%. That's like the fastest poll ever. They're saying no. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Maybe I should have come up with a better question, but yeah, I mean, I just want to point that out that I think all of us believe that knowledge of a theorem, knowledge of a definition doesn't mean students understand it. I cannot tell you how many times I've written a question where question A, state the definition, question B, use it in a meaningful way, and they contradict what they say in the first question. So it's important for us to, to test these sorts of things, to ask them questions, to see if they really understand the concepts behind it. Uh, this is something I like to do. Rather than stating things like the first derivative test, I give them a fill-in-the-blank thing and see if they are able to identify what those pieces have to be in those gaps to get the kind of thing we're looking for. Again, rather than giving you a, a full definition, let the students look at this, let the students have a conversation, work collaboratively, and come up with a hypothesis of what they think the definition is, and then test that moving forward. I think this is a really strong way to develop these kinds of ideas, to, to define notions, as well as to look at these sorts of theorems. Okay, my friends, here's my favorite question. I like question. the bold part. If you get nothing else out of today's discussion, <laughs> use this one, right? I want everyone to use this question. <clears throat> now, what does it say? It says, the following is not a graph of f prime. Excuse me. The following is a graph of f prime. In bold, it is not a graph of f. Now, you may make it bold, Doesn't capital, matter. red letters, put stars around it. Students will see always that that's a graph of you No, know, I have a joke about bold I have to share with you. The, question, you uh, the only reason we bold things on tests is so that we can find and circle them easier when they're ignored. <laughs> there you go. That's exactly right. Thank you, Maria. Uh, all right. So we want to use this graph to optimize F. So I like this problem again, talking about the first derivative test, using it in a different context than they're used to seeing. So yes, they might be able to state the first derivative test carefully. And even if they do believe that this is the derivative of f, can they use that to optimize the function f? So I think that's a really nice question. I've had a lot of success with this one. Students enjoy it. OK. And you'll notice most of the questions that I've talked about today are not questions that are easily graded by computers, nor are they easily graded uh, by hand. So I recognize that is one problem with these sorts of things. Here's a question that I like to give, and uh, see if you think this is valuable. Construct a graph of a function such that f of negative 1 is 5, f of 2 is negative 3, but there is no value c on the interval from negative 1 to 2 such that f of c is 0. So calculus teachers recognize I'm getting at the intermediate value theorem. This question can indeed be answered. The only way that it can be answered is if the function is not continuous, right? So this gets at the assumptions that we have to use things like the intermediate value theorem. And all of the answers should look different. And again, I think that's OK. It helps the students develop the understanding we want them to develop. <clears throat> Here's a more typical question. Let f of x equal x squared plus 3x plus 1. What does the intermediate value theorem tell us about the function on the interval from 0 to 5? Okay. So again, thinking about do they know what the IBT is, can they use it in context, rather than just stating what it was or asking a somewhat more trivial question. Okay, <clears throat> another similar question. Again, we're looking at definitions and theorems and whether students can understand what these things mean. This says, let k be any value between f of 0 and f of 5. f of 0 is 1 and f of 5 is 41. There must exist, <clears throat> there must exist, like maybe I should have said must there exist to c between 0 and 5 such that f of c equals k. Okay, so, I, so if k is anything between 1 and 41, must there be a c between 0 and 5 such that f of c equals k? And again, Intermediate value theorem sort of question. You'd hope they would draw a picture, and you would hope they would at least talk about continuity. Some student misconceptions that we see uh, with this sort of problem, between the interval of 0, 5, the value of c will always be positive, students say. 
for any value of c between 0 and 5, there exists a k such that f of c equals k. Many people have said that. Some students have said there are no zeros between 0 and 5. Some students have said there must be a point on the graph where x is between 0 and 5 and y is between 0 and 41. So that's in essence our story. Okay, now take a look at this one. <clears throat> h is 0.1, h is 0.01, h is 0.001, negatives as well. We want to evaluate 5 to the h minus 1 over h. So without actually doing this, how does the limit reflect a topic currently being studied? So think about that for a minute. That limit will be a number. You know what that number is? Mm. Limit will be a number. Maybe it will help if we think of that 1 as 5 to the 0. So now we have 5 to the h minus 5 to the 0 over h. It looks like a derivative of a function. Which function? Maybe the derivative of 5 to the x at 0. Again, uh, it's one I think that students enjoy. So looking at these numbers, here we get all of these things. It appears as if the limit is going to exist. We're, we're stabilizing, we're getting close to something. What is that something? Hopefully we know what that answer is using our exponential functions. So let me ask you this question. Do you think it's valuable to ask questions with multiple correct answers? Or do you think that might confuse students and make it more difficult for them to understand where things are going? Is it a good idea to ask questions with multiple correct answers? Or do you think that can cause us difficulty? So we'll see what people say on that. Oh, wait, I pulled up the wrong poll. You guys, why don't you guys just use the red, the red or green checks on this one for variety? Oh, that's fine. That's fine. My guess is most people are going to say yes. I mean, it's it depends. I agree with Susan saying that she thinks it depends on the context of the problem. And I do think there are ways that we can confuse students. I think maybe most of us agree, though, that textbooks don't typically do that. Computer software that grades problems don't typically do that because it's difficult to do. We don't have artificial intelligence to make sense out of these things. Here are some questions I like to sort of get in that regard. Namely, construct several functions such that f prime is not the same as f, but f double prime is the same as f. So can you think of some that would behave that way? f prime is, f, is not f, but f double prime is f. You know what we're doing here? We're doing a differential equation. But that's not what we want our students to do at this level. We want them to think about some of the functions that they've looked at. And this is the question I use to sort of introduce the hyperbolic functions, looking at hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine, or e to the negative x. That would be a way for us to get at that. All right, another construct an example question. Construct an example of a continuous function defined on 0, 3 that never achieves an absolute max. So we're getting at this notion of the extreme value theorem. Are there functions that can behave that way that never get there? And certainly there are. How about this one? Construct an example of a continuous function such that f of negative 2 is 3, f of 3 is 1, but f never achieves an absolute min on negative 2, 3. Continuous. f of negative 2 is 3, f of 3 is 1, but f never achieves an absolute min on negative 2, 3. Hopefully our students will know that that is not possible. The extreme value theorem tells us if we have a continuous function defined on a closed interval, okay, I'm assuming it's continuous everywhere, we're not playing any games with the endpoints. If we have a continuous function everywhere defined on a closed interval, then it has to achieve an absolute mean. So I don't mind asking questions where the answer is it's not possible or it's not going to happen. I think students can learn a lot from those as well. A more typical question, construct a graph of a function that is not continuous at x equals 2, but is differentiable at x equals 2. Good luck doing that as well. We switch differentiable and continuous, now that's a more traditional sort of question. If it's not differentiable, but is continuous, we have our absolute value function. But if it's not continuous, but is differentiable, we know there's no solution to that. So I think this helps the students start to understand what differentiability means. Some student misconceptions we get from the previous example, a function with a vertical asymptote, 
a piecewise function with a non-removable discontinuity, a function with a horizontal asymptote, a function with a removable discontinuity at x equals 2, all types of misconceptions we see on the previous example. Well, you probably have noticed I'm not much on real-world applications. I recognize that in physics, in astronomy, in meteorology, calculus is used all the time. But to me, the greatest use of calculus is to solve problems in a vast number of areas. So I, I tend to focus on different sorts of problems. Although this is one application that I think is pretty good. If we say that a family uh, begins a car trip at 2, and at 4 the car has traveled a total of 80 miles, can you use a concept from calculus to explain why there must have been an instance where the speedometer read exactly 40 miles an hour. Okay. There's a couple different ways to do this. So they have gone 80 miles in two hours. So on average, they've gone 40 miles an hour. And on average, they've gone 40 miles an hour. There's our mean value theorem sort of discussion. So if f is continuous on 2, 4, differentiable on open interval 2, 4, there must be at least one point between 2 and 4 where the derivative is 40. And that would be the point where the car was going exactly 40 miles an hour at that instance. Now, of course, we have to say that driving a car, uh, the distance that's traversed, is going to be both a continuous and differentiable function. And that gives us an opportunity to have some interesting discussions as well. OK, some Calc 2 questions. Uh, so this is the sort of thing that we looked at before in terms of looking at inverse functions, but this is a slightly different approach. If f of x is 2 to the x plus x plus 5, and g of x is f inverse of x, what is the derivative of g at 8? Every calculus book has a formula that enables you to solve this. I don't think students remember that formula, nor do I think they need to, because it's relatively easily developed using an implicit derivative. So if I say y is f inverse of x, f of y is x, f prime of y dy dx is 1, the derivative 1 over f prime of y, the derivative 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. Replacing that with 8, I need to see what f inverse of 8 is. But finding f inverse of 8 is not easy, but it just so happens with guess and check, f of 1 is 8, so f, f inverse of 8 is 1. So my answer will be 1 over f prime of 1, which is relatively easy to do. 1 over f prime of 1, 1 over 2 log 2 plus 1. So a non-traditional question, connecting it to the implicit derivatives, okay, and then developing it from that perspective gives them a strategy they can use to solve that problem. Okay, take a look at this question and think about how you would solve that. Negative 1 to the n, pi to the 2n plus 1, over 9 to the n, 2n plus 1 factorial. Do you recognize the underlying function that this is based on? Does this look like the Maclaurin series for sine? Not quite. I have 2 to the n plus 1 here. I have 9 to the n down here. We need to somehow get these exponents to be the same if we're going to appeal to our Maclaurin series for sine. So how could we rewrite this so that we get this in a form that we could use? with sine. So there indeed is our Maclaurin series for sine, negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1, or 2n plus 1 factorial. And there's a lot of algebra here. I'll just give you a couple of the highlights. 9 to the n becomes 3 to the 2n. That's not a problem. Multiply by 3 over 3 here because it'll be 3 to the 2n times 3 or 3 to the 2n plus 1 times a third. If I bring that 1 third out, that'll be a 3 up here. And now I'm in a form that I can use the sine function. Negative 1 to the n, pi over 3 to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. That, of course, is 3 times the sine of pi over 2. Okay, if you're on a desert island, and you need to compute pi. This is a very bad way to do it, but it is a way to do it. It doesn't converge very quickly, but I think it's a fact that a lot of students find fascinating that pi is 4 minus 4 thirds plus 4 fifths minus 4 sevenths, etc. 
So it's sort of a fascinating way to generate an approximation for pi. Now, where does this come from? What's the idea that we're working with here? Well, we know the derivative of arctangent of x. We can integrate that. So using our series, we, we get relatively simply, we get a series for arctangent of x. We know arctangent of 1 is pi over 4. So multiplying by 4, we get our answer that way. So you know, one of the things I think that we do wrong is we give students too many directions. We give them too many hints. We lead them through the process. But I see nothing wrong with asking students to create a scheme to approximate pi using Maclaurin series, hint arctangent. Maybe. Maybe even not giving them the hint. But we have to allow our students to fail, allow our students to think, let them work together, and try to generate these kinds of ideas. Okay, another somewhat non-traditional problem. Uh, find a such that the integral from 0 to a of x plus 1 dx is 10. Yes, we can do this with the fundamental theorem of calculus. I would prefer if students would do this geometrically and draw a picture. What I like about this problem is there's two values of a. There's one a that's positive and there's one a that is not. So if that's the case, how can we make sense from that perspective? Similarly, getting a visual interpretation of the definite integral. Can we evaluate the integral from 0 to 4 of f of x dx, identifying the area above the curve, the area below the curve, and making sense of that? This is becoming more standard in textbooks, I am happy to say. This is like the other question that I had given you. Use the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate this. <clears throat> Reversing the idea, so I am giving you a limit of a Riemann sum. That's what's given. You're given the limit of Riemann sum. Can you rewrite that thing as an integral so that you can evaluate it using the fundamental theorem of calculus? And for this, what you're welcome to look at. You'd be surprised how many students struggle with this. You think of all the time that we spend with series and calculus, too. You'd think if you asked them to construct an infinite series that sums to 5, they would be able to do it. Especially if it's just 5 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. You'd be surprised how many students struggle. The students that get this right, for the most part, use a geometric series of some kind. But more than half really cannot do this. I think it's a question we should ask them to look at. Okay. A brutal problem would be to find the Maclaurin series for e to the 2x cos x. If you're going to find first, second, third, fourth derivatives and look for trends, it's going to be miserable. But what we can do is, is we can get the first few terms of the e to the 2x series, the first few terms of the cos x series, and multiply. So let's look at that. There's our e to the 2x series, and there is our cos x series. Now how can you multiply two infinite series? You need to be creative. We don't have uh, an easy way to do the distribution. So we have those two infinite series. We want to multiply them. I use a multiplication box, not unlike the way they're teaching kids how to do multiplication today. So we're multiplying one of those this way, the other one this way. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times negative a half x squared, negative a half x squared. 1 times 24th x to the 4th, or 24th x to the 4th. 2x times 1 is 2 to the x. 2x times negative a half x squared, negative a half x cubed, etc. We only go up to the fourth power and then add up all the pieces, add up all the common uh, factors, common terms, to go ahead and get the first five terms of that Maclaurin series without really a whole lot of effort. So using uh, smart strategies to get there, I think, is effective. Another question I'd like you to do visually. Um, integral from negative 2 to 2 of 2 minus the absolute value of x. Absolute value of x, not differentiable. Function is not differentiable. But we certainly can find the area under the curve by looking at a picture. Another one of my favorite questions. Prove that the integral from negative r to r of x cubed dx converges. But the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x cubed dx diverges. Any r you use, that integral is always zero because the blue area, the blue arrow, the blue area here, 
right, is going to match the red area down here. So whatever you use, those things are going to give me zero. But if we're going to go ahead and do this integral from minus infinity to infinity, what's happening there? Well, we know that both pieces have to converge. From zero to infinity has to converge. Mean Negative infinity to zero has to converge. They do not. So this sort of forces us to have a conversation about what it means for an integral to converge. What does it mean for an integral to diverge? This is counterintuitive. This bothers a lot of people. But our definition for a convergent integral tells us that this piece here, from zero to infinity, would have to be finite. And it is not. Clearly, it is not. But the integral from minus r to r converges. So th this, to me, is a stepping off point for a lot of interesting questions. Another stepping off point. If the sum of a sub n and the sum of b sub n are both divergent, is the sum of a sub n plus the uh, b sub n necessarily divergent? And the answer to that is, of course, no. A sub n could be 1. B sub n could be negative 1. Obviously, that's going to be the case. Um, but this also gets us a notion of, well, what would have to be true for that to be the case? And it starts off some, some good discussions. A couple Calc 3 questions here that I don't typically see in textbooks. Construct two vectors, each with magnitude 5, orthogonal to 3, 1. Okay. We, we've seen many questions given two vectors, three-dimensional vectors, construct a vector orthogonal to both of them. We've seen those questions many times because we have a tool. We use a cross product. This doesn't have a tool ready-made to use, but it helps the students get at what the key ideas here are with the vectors. This was my favorite fact of math as a kid. You put four points on the wall, anywhere, you connect their mid midpoints, you will always get a parallelogram. I found this endlessly fascinating. And this is very easy to do with vectors. And a, a corollary to that would be if you just have a triangle going from this point to this point, right? That's going to be twice as long as this midline. So another fascinating fact about, about geometry, we can prove very easily with vectors, so I think that that's a nice thing to look at. Another one, if u is orthogonal to v and v is orthogonal to w, must u be orthogonal to w? u is orthogonal to v and v is orthogonal to w, must u be orthogonal to w? Relatively easy question for us to answer, one that's a little challenging for our students. Uh, I cannot tell a lie. I am not good at drawing three-dimensional figures. And one way I've gotten around that is rather than drawing them or asking the students to draw them, I like them to construct equations of a certain type. So when I'm teaching the quadric surfaces, I'll ask a question like this. I'll say, construct an equation of a hyperboloid of two sheets whose axis of symmetry is the x-axis. And then I tell them it looks like two satellite dishes facing away from each other. They need to think about the traces. They need to put all those together to come up with an equation that satisfies those conditions. Here's a question that I stole from Larson's calculus book. Using the great circle distance, find the distance between two cities. Of course, doing this is going to require spherical coordinates. Doing this is going to require you to know the radius of the Earth. Doing this is going to require you to know the dot product to find the angle between the two radial vectors to those two cities. So there's a lot of coordination here, as well as, of course, extending our ideas from spherical coordinates into a new domain. Of course, the Earth is not a sphere. It's, it's somewhat compressed at the North and South Pole. But you'd be surprised how close these answers are. Uh, so after I do this, probably go on a website and look at the flying distance. Giving you the position function of a spaceship and the coordinates of a space station. The captain wants to coast into the space station. When should the engines be turned off? We know that when you turn the engines off, the spaceship will follow the directions of the, vo the direction of the velocity. So at what time does that have to happen? so that we land in the point 649. So I think you'll enjoy that question if you get a chance to work on it. I will give you a hint, a pretty good hint. The answer is t equals 1. 
time equals one. Another question I like to give is, describe how to find the distance between two skew lines. In Cal 3, we talk about distance between a point and a plane, distance from a point to a line, even distance between two planes. But I do not think I've seen a discussion of how to find the distance between two skew lines in a calculus book. And to do this, you need to look at the two direction vectors and take their cross products. Once you do that, you found a vector that's orthogonal to both lines. Pick a point on each line, construct that vector, project it onto the vector orthogonal to both lines, and find that, find the distance of that uh, projection, and then you'll be able to find the distance between the two skew lines. You don't need to memorize a formula standing up in front of the class with a couple of pencils. It's a powerful way to demonstrate how you can do these sorts of things without memorizing. Now, again, I mentioned I can't draw very well. Here's the hyperbolic paraboloid. Some people call a saddle. I like to call that a Pringle in honor of one of my favorite potato chips. And looking at this, <clears throat> using the usual orientation of axes, so with the x-axis coming out at us, right? x-axis coming out at us, y-axis left to right, z-axis up and down, can the student identify what an equation would be that would, that would develop that graph? So I think that's another powerful question to ask students. Multiple answers. We're not saying what the denominators are going to be of those, but I think that's a nice question. True or false questions with the TNB frame. Um, you can take a look at that. Uh, I'm not going to ask Maria to put this poll up there. Is there sufficient time to prove most of the important theorems in class? The answer to that is no. Here's another fill-in-the-blank proof. <clears throat> this is the proof about curvature. Curvature is the magnitude of velocity cross acceleration divided by speed cubed. That is a really nice fact. It is somewhat difficult to prove. But if you sort of lay it out for the students and let them fill in the gaps, I believe that they are capable of getting where they need to get on this problem. And then they can use that fact to actually prove that notion. And then I think this is the last one I have here, namely, find the curvature of the spiral of Archimedes. So we know what curvature is. We define curvature as V cross A divided by speed cubed. How do we relate that to polar coordinates to be able to find this problem? And then how do we relate the polar coordinates back to parametric coordinates to enable us to use the V cross A problem? So it's a nice way to sort of extend our ideas into new domains. Okay, this presentation is available at that site. I believe Maria's made that to, available to you as well. I have many presentations up at that site. You're looking for the one titled AMATIC Webinar 2012, bracket one. And that's who I am, Bob Capetta, Professor of Mathematics, College of DuPage. I am also serving as the president of our statewide organization, the Illinois Mathematics of Community Co Association of Community Colleges. So it's been a busy time for me, but I very much enjoyed the time to spend with you. Well, yeah. I'm going to switch else back over to my other slides here. I think we should all go into the little um, the little hand dude menu and uh, give Robert a round of applause for his first webinar. It's, it's always a little bit uh, trepidatious for our uh, webinar much. speakers to get through there first. Um, and I'm going to go back to these slides so I can just kind of wrap up here. If I can find the right slides. Oh. Here. I seem to be experiencing some slowdown here. Let's try again. There we go. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Well, better now. Um, so, um, thanks for participating to everybody in the webinar, especially on a Friday. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member of AMATIC, you'll get announcements about this um, through AMATIC. Uh, we also have a Facebook page, so you can typically find out about future webinars there as well. And recordings can be found at the following link. Um, it's a, a bit.ly link. Oops. Hold on. And then um, finally, I need you guys to go and evaluate this webinar, if you would. It just takes a minute or two. I think there's like eight simple questions. Also, if you need a receipt that you attended this webinar today, you need to do the evaluation. It's like your uh, confirmation that you were here. 
So um, I will also put the direct Zoomerang link here into the window. So here's the direct Zoomerang link. And here's the shortened version if you want to go to it from that. Either one of those should work, but sometimes the bit.ly links don't work for people. Um, <clears throat> so again, I just want to thank Robert. And I actually, your your talk just reminded me of something I used to do long ago before I did um, so much online teaching. Um, and I think you would, I, I think you'd quite like it. So I'm going to put it in this. It was a way to turn any problem into a writing problem to some extent. And um, I had the students, I would just assign two problems for every section and the students had to, um, they were, each problem was worth five points. Four points for, was for doing the problem correctly. And the fifth point was for doing something else with the problem. And that's where like they would go and explore the whole possibility space and you would see all sorts of interesting stuff. You had never anticipated that students had these misconceptions. And a lot of time they'd choose to write about it or they'd choose to prove it was correct and discover it wasn't. Um, but I, I found out so much about what the students thought was correct that I didn't even realize was out there when I did that for several years. And so it was a very nice way to involve writing without having to actually write a lot of, of different problems. So um, I just I just remembered that and thought I would share that at the end here. Sure. Um, yeah, it it was like I, I discovered the fascinating fact, for example, that students think that, um, you know, when you when they go to find the derivative at a different value, it doesn't occur to them that the value has to be on the curve. Because, of course, they never encounter that in a textbook, right? They're never asked in a textbook to find the derivative of a value that's not on the curve. But they would do like, all right, for my elaboration, I'm going to find the derivative at 2 comma 1. Never mind the fact that 2 comma 1 is not on the, the function at all. And so just these very strange things would happen. And so it was it was a really nice little teaching tool, and a nice little mind reading tool, too, if you say so. Yeah, so um, anyways, uh, any other questions for Robert? As he shared some great resources with us today and some great um, questions that we can use. Uh, some of the questions felt like old friends, and some of them were like, oh, well, you could be a new friend. So, um, all right, then uh, we'll call it a day because it's Friday. And uh, we're, it's Friday. And this, this webinar should be up pretty quickly. We got the one up from it's Tuesday. Friday. I think it's going up today. So um, if, uh, if you uh, want to see something again or you want to share it with a friend, uh, just keep an eye on the website. I'll back up to that slide for a second so you can write it down if um, 